Hi, Joel. Um, I had a question about Gordo. Um, if Simon had never rebuked him, do you think he would have ever turned nasty? Do you think, or, or tried to take revenge? Do you, does, would it have just played out as this, this friendly relationship? I never wanted to make a straight out revenge movie uh, to presume to say that uh, this guy had stalked his old nemesis for 20 something years and been waiting for the day that he would be able to catch him in a net. I, I always felt like what I wanted to do was to tell a story where that by chance encounter of the two men had an, it, it created an opportunity for, for uh, the character of Simon, Jason Bateman's character, to um, begin a, a, a resolution from his point of view, to, to be able to do what he, he is unable to do later in the film, as we find out, to look back, to acknowledge, to make amends. And it's that that causes the real decision from Gordo to do something more. I always thought like there were two things running for Gordo, you know, in my mind as a, as a writer and as an actor is that there, there seemed to me to be the potential for two victories, one of two victories. And if, if, if Simon's overtures of friendship, which are, as we find out, false, this sort of lovely kind of great to see you and God, you look well and we really have to catch up. All that nonsense that Simon comes out with, which is an overcompensation. If that were actually true and there was a space for a friendship, then that's the, the better of the two victories for Gordo. It's like, if this guy wants to be my friend now, yeah. then it somehow rewrites the history. But if he's not being genuine, which Gordo suspects he may not be, and then he's proven to be, then something else is coming. And as we find out through traces in the movie too, there's a real Old Testament kind of mantra going on with Gordo, you know, the, the eye for an eye kind of issues and the, you know, dig your own pit and fall into it issues. I mean, that, that there's, uh, there's, he claims to be a person of, that is willing to forgive and yet there are conditions. Thank you. I talked to you last night for a sec about um, the the Hitchcock feeling that mm. I got in the movie. I'm am an editor and and so I pay attention to theme and and uh, you know the overtones and stuff that that come through the movie, and um, I got a lot of that Hitchcockian feeling from several different scenes in the movie, and I also noticed a judicious lack of music. Mm. So and, and I appreciated that as well. Are are you? Is Hitchcock one of your influencers? Um, the lack of music, I mean, was that done on purpose? I mean, did, was, was every scene studied and we're going to have a, a soundtrack here, we're not? Uh, what are your thoughts on that and, and your influences? Well, I'll start with the music. The, the, there is actually quite a bit of music, but, but I think what you're responding to is there's certain key moments in the movie where my instinct and my editor's instinct, I'd like, I'd like to actually bring up my editor, Luke Doolan, who also cut Animal Kingdom and he's a very good friend of mine and was a very great partner w with me in the post-production process of the movie. More than just an editor, really great at sourcing uh, temp music and a very smart sort of cinephile himself. And, and, you know, we wanted to create tension by taking sound and music away and finding ways of doing that rather than go, okay, here's a scary scene, so let's, let's throw lots of sharp violins and let's destroy a few piano strings. Um, and, so, and rather put, put the music sort of in the right places that, that were more kind of bridging between scenes and, and occasionally scoring dialogue scenes. But keeping those moments in particular, like the dis rediscovery of the dog mm -hmm. and... Um, you know, there's other scary moments, kind of spare of music, because you know, my, my instinct is always that if you're if you're in a house alone and you feel like you're not alone, what are you trying to do? You're trying to listen for all the important sounds that are going to give you the clue as to whether you're right or you're wrong. Um, so, in many ways, you know, as much as I have seen a lot of movies in my life, I wasn't trying to. 
I was trying to, along the way, trust my own instincts. And I'm sure a lot of that has been informed by all those movies I've seen, plus my own just general feeling about logic when it comes to being an actor and then trying to apply that to being a filmmaker. But I, I think I mentioned last night, it's funny, my taste as an actor is often very different from my taste as a writer. And, and I just keep finding myself writing these thrillers. Some of them are redemptive. Some of them are a little bit more oppressive. There was a few murders in the first one I wrote, my brother directed Call the Square. Uh, the second one I wrote, Felony, is, is very much um, a kind of a man struggling with having done something wrong. I mean, they're all about someone doing something wrong and trying to find their way back to, to an honest, more honest place. In this film, the character's you know, done something wrong 20 years earlier and is, is trying to find, his, is, is actually trying not to find his way back to an honest place. Mm -hmm. He's trying to justify his position and saying right. that that was a long time ago and I'm not responsible. Um, but, you know, thrillers have been a big sort of staple part of my uh, movie diet since I went to drama school. Before that, it was all Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester oh, Stallone, sure. action movies, martial arts movies. That's what I grew up on. And all horror movies like, you know, Friday the 13th. Oh, yeah. And, um, and movies like, you know, revenge movies like Death Wish. And, you know. Oh, yeah. It's funny. There's sort of like pinch elements of all that stuff, funnily enough, in this movie. But when I got to drama school, I got right into Hitchcock, you know, and I really got excited by um, the, the ideas within those movies. I felt like they all had some kind of social uh, resonance or social context. It wasn't just murder for the sake of murder all right. the time. And, and, and so, um, you know, post that, post, you know, learning a lot about Hitchcock along the way, I was also, I was so into, you know, Coen Brothers and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and old movies like Body Heat. I, I somehow responded to noirish thrillers and, and, um, and of course, you know, there's, there's little hints in this movie. There's actually little kind of clues and visual hints to movies like The Shining, right. um, Rosemary's Baby. Yeah, I, I picked up on a Rosemary's Baby vibe in there when they're at the confronting about the drugs. Um, yeah. I, I very much, from her perspective, I felt that helpless, no one's believing me moment yeah. uh, that you get in Rosemary's Baby. Yeah. Yeah, and there's actually, there's little kind of clue in the medicine cabinet that is a real like tip of the hat to uh, to Rosemary's Baby, um, you know, and so th those things have definitely become an influence on me. And and I, w I was asking myself really big questions in terms of the construction of the movie, like how do we create that same sense of dread and fear that you can create easily in the night time? How do we try and also create that in the daytime? How do we turn this kind of uh, aspirational, beautiful, uh, welcoming house at the beginning, then into a, a house that you're like, I, I kind of hate being in here by the end of the movie because, uh, yeah, so yes, uh, yeah, the, the short answer to your question is <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, so otherwise I will talk all day. <laughs> hey, Joel, um, you've acted in a ton of movies. You've clearly written other screenplays. Why was it time for you to finally step in the director's chair and talk a little bit about, while you did have a role in the movie, how this process compared to your acting experience? Acting to me is always like, it's a great job for, you know, I preface this by saying I hate to complain about acting as a job because I've, that, even then I have the greatest job in the world, but it's, it's great for certain portions of the day and the rest of the time, is, is about waiting around for the next great thing to happen. Because you're not in control, you're waiting for the big machine to work and, um, and it's up to you to kind of how you use the rest of your time. And out of a 12 hour day, I would say you're probably really only working two hours of the day. The rest of it is waiting around. And, and, um, and that's fine, except that, you know, what I got out of directing the movie and I, I knew and was looking forward to was, was using more of my brain for more of the time. And, and being across the, all the aspects of the storytelling in a way that I'd watched my brother and my friends do and, and watched a lot of great directors along the way do. And of course, I had the ability to go and cherry pick all of the great, you know, styles and qualities, you know, 
styles of sort of operation, I mean, in terms of social skills, how to relate to actors, all that stuff, from all those directors I'd worked with. Um, which is a kind of unique and privileged position being an actor because you get to work with so many people and you can learn good and bad from, from everybody else. Um, as an actor, being a part of my own film, that was always a question that I maybe shouldn't do it, you know, from myself. It's like, should I be doing both things? What allowed me to feel comfortable doing it was the fact that out of, I think, a 25-day schedule, I was on screen for about seven of those. Uh, and I had my brother, you know, Nash, who, who's directed movies before and um, is a great support to me and someone I have a really good dialogue with. He was there on set as a kind of a creative outside eye for me. Um, also to, to call action and cut. And for me to look at and go, do I need to do another take? I'm happy. How do you feel? Did, did it seem okay to you? And then we could move on without me having, you know, to look at the monitor. Um, you know, and the, and the other part of your question is it, it's something I've been keeping my eye on for a long time is knowing that at some point uh, opportunities, I mean, there's a number of reasons. Opportunities as an actor, as I get older, I'm sure they're going to change and shift and the responsibilities become less. Um, you know, I, I've been writing movies and thinking about getting to a point of directing for a long time, so there's been a sort of an artful stepping stone process. You know, I write one, sit and watch, write and produce one, sit and watch. And now this time I felt like it was a contained enough uh, and manageable enough idea for me to do that. Um, and, you know, I remember reading a great thing, uh, Clint Eastwood saying that one of the reasons he got into directing movies was because he thought that after a while people were going to get sick of watching him in, watching him in movies, which turned out to not be true. Um, but it's also a great gift that he has given, you know, in terms of how many movies has he directed, 30 plus something, maybe even more. 39, there you go. <laughs> um, you know, and, and, uh, and also great to know too, because I always feel like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm getting started pretty late, but you know, then I got to work with Ridley and he directed his first movie when he was 39 or 40. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a number of reasons why I wanted to do it, but partly out of love, partly out of interest to see whether it, it was a good fit for me to be behind the camera. But also because I, I just think I get to use more of my brain and, and moving into the future that will probably keep me alive and engaged a lot longer than, than just waiting on a set to be told where to stand and what to say. Yeah, hurry up and wait. <laughs> yeah, hurry up and wait, exactly. Yeah. I don't know who's, who coined that phrase, but it's, it's so perfect and, and so uh, like constantly used. Yeah, it really is. Hurry up and wait. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. You were talking before about some of the thriller influences that you have, but this is a very character-driven uh, script. And uh, can, can you talk about maybe a little bit about what got you started on it? Was it a certain, was it one of these three characters that got you started? Was it kind of an idea that, that sort of jump-started this for you? Yeah, the idea that jump-started the movie was, was what would it be like for, for someone 20, 25 years after high school to run into the person that they didn't treat so well. And I think that the rules of engagement in high school are so dark, you know. I describe high school... Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, I, I describe high school once, you know, that... You know, it's a great documentary. I don't know who made it, but I'm sure it was, was Attenborough was narrating it uh, about a, a kind of a a watering hole in Africa as the summer's taking hold and the water source is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. But more and more of the animals are coming around because they all need that last drink. But it's every kind of animal, you know, it's the crocodiles and the hippopotamuses who don't really fear anybody else. But then you've got the little fluffy, cuter kind of antelopes and so on. They've all got to have a drink. And that, to me, what school is like. You're all forced into the same area, and some of you are rulers, and some of you are just trying to get by and not get eaten, you know. And, and sending kids off to school is such a kind of a... <laughs> it's such a potentially uh, dangerous place. I mean, it, it's, for some of us, it's the wonder years. And, that, like, I had a great time in high school. Um, um, but, but those things exist that for some kids, high school is terrifying and others, uh, it's, it's a walk in the park and it's, but, but 
there, there are kids being very cruel to each other. In the way that if we were all doing that to each other, we'd get arrested or we'd you know, be, be seriously reprimanded for it. Whereas school is like, oh, they're just kids, they're all playing, but when the teachers aren't looking, the shit that goes down is heavy. You know, so the idea of that, those bad things having happened, and then everybody graduates and sort of wanders off into the world. And then what if 25 years later you come back around and one of those people just taps you on the shoulder and goes, hey, do you remember me? That to me just felt like such an interesting place to start the movie. And, and you know, I knew I wanted to make the thrilling version of that, the thriller version of that, rather than the didactic drama version of that. You know, on that note, I say, you know, I said to the audience last night, I didn't want to make a, and haven't presumed to have made a, an essay on, you know, the, the wrongs of bullying, because there's doc, great documentary about that. There's great other material on that. But to make that thrilling version of that, but I didn't also just want to make a straight thriller, you know, a slasher thriller or where there's a body count or lots of blood being spilled. I wanted to, to have it also mean something about those roles we play and about how, um, um, you know, whether or not we should have a mindfulness to be able to look back uh, with an open heart and acknowledge the things we've done. Of course, this is the, the dark version of that story when you don't do it. <laughs> like Simon in the film, uh, Jason Bateman's character, as a kid I was terrified of toy monkeys. <laughs> you were. <laughs> yeah. It, it probably stemmed from like movies that I probably shouldn't have been watching when I was a kid, like The Devil's Gift, which also has a chiming monkey in it. <laughs> uh, but do you have anything in your life that you find that's probably inherently not scary at all, but you find it scary? Uh, I used to be terrified of water when I was a kid. Like, funnily enough, now I'm not terrified of water at all. I surf all the time. But I used to have these, like, crazy dreams when I was a kid where I lived, which were that the valley I was living in was getting flooded. And so I quite often would, you know, wake up and climb up into the cupboard and, and, um, and sleep on the top shelf. I remember a couple of times my father found me, like, with my you know, all the bedding up there <laughs> tucked up on the, on the top shelf. And I don't know whether it stemmed from, like, being made to learn to swim at a really, really early age and just literally being, like, thrown in the water. Yeah. But it, it's crazy what people are frightened of. I know someone who's terrified of bananas. <laughs> <laughs> you ever heard of that? It's a true phobia, banana phobia. Yeah, slipophobia. Slip? Yeah, you just slip on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but also, like, just the texture of them, eating them, the smell of them. In fact, I knew two sisters. I still know two sisters. I'm not going to name them. But <laughs> one of them's terrified of bananas. The other one's uh, terrified of uh, wooden spoons. And I saw this argument, this fight between the two of them. And the way the fight manifested was one of them was peeling a banana in front of the other one with this sort of malicious intent. And the other one's like... You know, the moment she started chewing it, the other one ran off to the kitchen and came back with a wooden spoon and starts going, <laughs> and they both go, oh! It was like they were both holding kryptonite out to each other. It was weird. I'm glad that, you, I'm glad that you're terrified of monkeys. Have you gotten over it, though? Uh, it's switched over to um, Jaws. Like, I can't go in pools. Oh, there's monkey sharks. I have to... I stay on the steps. I can't go. You're worried about swimming pools, having a shark in them. <laughs> yep. That's so beautiful. I'm not going to criticise you for that at all because it's great. I mean, it's... I feel for you. <laughs> Hi, Joel. Um, Hi. One of the techniques in films today that I despise is the handheld approach that they use in so many movies. Oh. And I loved in The Gift, you shot what I refer to as old school. I grew up in the 70s and the 80s, so beautiful widescreen camera angles, slow tracking shots, utilize that throughout the whole movie. Mm. Was that element something you knew you were going to use from the very beginning or did like your DP suggest it to you? I was always, whenever I met with a DP or talked to them about it, um, I was very heartened. Sorry, I've got a chewing gum incident going on here. I was very heartened to, to hear that it, it, what was reflected back to me from anybody I spoke to, the, the few cinematographers I spoke to, they felt like it, it needed to be, you know, classic in its, in its form. And, and that's the way I'd written the movie. So whether they picked that off the page or whether they sensed that 
it needed to have that kind of feeling, a Hitchcock feeling about it. But that became a reference to us down the line through music and costume and, and the sets that we chose. But Edu Grau, who shot the film, who shot a, a single man, uh, you know, and he's not opposed to putting the camera on his shoulder either. He's, he just shot a um, very much, I guess, a handheld version of a, a period movie uh, in the Suffragettes. You know, if you see the trailer for that, it's very much more modern in its, its right. form. So that's interesting. But, um, you know, he saw the movies very classic. I wanted that feeling of, you know, this is very important to me, this whole signature of pushing down corridors and pulling away from right. them, this feeling of a presence coming. Um, and and I, lo I love that. I knew it was going to take a little bit longer to shoot than if we just threw the camera over our shoulder. Um, and I, I get a little disoriented when I watch a lot of handheld movies. Some people do it really well. We did it a couple of times. You know, if you notice in the car park, Jason at the end of the film and he's running looking. There are moments right. where we, we, we change that form. But, I mean, he just shot the movie so beautifully well, considering the time constraints we had. I had such a great partner in Edu and I, th I think he's made the movie look beautiful. In fact, it can be said across the board with Luke, my editor, and Edu with Sa uh, Sauna and, and Danny who composed the music um, and, and Julian who's my sound designer and Terry, my costume designer, that, that everybody around me really allowed me uh, to, to a, learn more about the filmmaking process that I'd always viewed from a different angle. Um, and, and, you know, I, I believe that good filmmakers, one way of making a good film is just to hire really great people and have them help you steer the ship, you know, unashamedly feeling like you don't need to control everything. Because if I did, I probably would have steered it in the wrong direction here and there. Um, but I had such a great team and Edu, you know, uh, as one of the most important people on set as a cinematographer, was such a blessing to me. Thank you. I'm curious, as an actor getting to direct, and I'm curious how how hands-on were you with the actual casting, like picking Jason, picking Rebecca, and then some of the smaller roles. I really loved uh, Allison, who's a, who's a Dallasite. Yeah. Like, she was kind of the voice of reason almost. And then, like, Wendell, uh, the detective. Can you talk about getting quality actors and then getting to direct them and did you find yourself just is it is it weird to to look at them from that perspective not acting off of them or with them it was weird at some point i realized i'd inadvertently cast uh half of the cast of uh horrible bosses too because <laughs> they were all high-fiving each other on set and i'm like you all know each other what's going on here and because uh, i hadn't seen that movie yet and, uh, you know, Wendell had been in it, and I think PJ, who plays Danny McDonald, had been in, in that movie too. Look, I had a great um, casting director, Terry Taylor, who works at Blumhouse. You know, it was really great, because as I was diving into pre-production, uh, she was throwing all these sort of interesting people at me to look at. And, and I know how important that is, because when I was an actor who, who didn't really have my leg in the door, Casting directors are your best friends because if they see value in you and you're kind of an unknown quantity, they're the people who are going to put you in front of the directors, you know. And you want to cast a movie as quickly as possible with the right people. Um, and she really did that for the supporting cast for me. It's like, you know, put the right sort of people in front of me. Um, and, and, and quite often the most surprising people, like I'd, I'd have an idea for a character and she'd say, well, you know, how about this guy? Um, you know, or you, you write a role as a woman or, or you write a role as a guy and then she's like, well, what, what if that character was a woman? And you're like, oh, that's a good idea. You know, that's not a bad idea. Let's, let's look at some women. Um, and, and, and good casting directors will do that with gender and race and age and all sorts of challenge you. And, and, it, and if, if at the very end of the day it just teaches you that your instincts were right in the first place and then that's also an excursion worth taking and you've also along the way learn about other good actors and mind you along the way I've like looked at actors for this and I've gone okay you're not right for this but god I'd like to work with you on something else. Jason and Rebecca were, were the two main ones for me obviously early on you try and cast the big roles first and Rebecca was a given to me like if I could get her to like the project then she was perfect for me she was someone who 
you look at on screen, you trust and you love and you respect and you, you feel like there's no kind of shadows or hidden corners in her. And I needed that for Robin, someone that we could just go, okay, we, you're the good person and you're not going to change. Jason, on the other hand, was, was not the most obvious choice. And I often thought about that character as a real, like, ex-jock, you know, more of the guy that's come down through collegiate sort of football and was, was less able to destroy people with words but more his sort of ability to push them over and, you know, bully them physically. But the more interesting version of that character was Jason, the more kind of lived by his wits, gift of the gab, kind of talk his way in, the, any, in or out of any situation. Because I thought that that kind of person is often more dangerous and more subversive. The beauty of getting Jason was that it's, you know, it's like getting Steve Carell to do Foxcatcher or, you know, Jim Carrey doing, you know, Eternal Sunshine and Spotless Mind is when you take these people who are really good at being funny and, and show the world that they're also excellent at being serious. Now, I wasn't the first person to get Jason to be serious, but um, definitely the first in a bigger role. Um, is that it's more surprising and, and, and more surprising for the movie, you know, to, to go down that road of going, let's, let's trust and like this guy because we already do and let, let's let him, you know, transform in terms of revealing a darker side. So, I mean, I'm, I'm thrilled with the cast that I, that I have. As you mentioned, Alison, who's, like, excellent. I, and I just wish I had more for them to do in the movie, you know, because they sort of, with these great actors that I got, like Wendell, and Alison, who came in and just did one or two scenes or a few handful of scenes, they're, they're worth their weight for so much more than that. But I'm sure you'll see. And this young kid who's the other young cop, um, Bo Knapp, I think he's in like 10 movies that are going to come out over the next two years. You see a lot of him too. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the premise of the movie. Uh, you mentioned Gordo's choices along the way. I was wondering if you worked in actually writing the script the way so many mystery writers do, however, knowing how it's going to end and working back from it, or in constructing the script, did you start from the front and follow the crossroads in any direction they might have taken? I, I definitely started, you know, writing the story from start to finish, but it, it's interesting you note that big, of, of working backwards because quite often then I would start to kind of cross-check the script, you know, in, in reverse fashion and just, and, and you really do, I think you're pointing it out, you really do have to look at the whole thing from all angles in a three-dimensional way and just see how every thread affects every other thread because, you know, these movies have such careful plotting and you want to, I don't know, like you, you, you're always coming up against contrivances or convenient sort of moments within a story. You know, I, ne I know I need my character to get from here to here and it's easy if I just go across the bridge rather than walk down all the way through the canyon, but really what I should do is walk all the way through the canyon. You know, so you want to not be clever and, and use too much trickery because the audiences are very smart, I think. So sometimes plotting a movie, you know, story terms plot can be so um, infuriating because you know, you know when you're cheating and you know when you're not. Um, and oftentimes the answer to how to make something not a cheat is to really go back and examine character. So like <laughs> constantly floating back between plot and character and, and turning the thing in every different angle and direction just to cross check things. You hope that um, through a lot of careful writing and rewriting and, and, uh, and, and the support of other r writers to read the stuff, um, that the thing starts to feel more and more airtight, you know. And then, and then the last part of the writing process is the editing. And again, I'm, you know, I mentioned Luke Doolan, you know, he and I have partnered together on a couple of things and it's a great, an editor, there's no one better than an editor to put fresh eyes on the writing process and saying, hey, I know you have this scene and this scene together like that, but what if you swap them? Uh, and, and there's no harm in trying any, anything, I think. Since you brought up the Old Testament, yes, <laughs> I couldn't help but pick on, pick up on. Uh, I'm interested in things like uh, moral motivations for the characters. Yeah, and and if it's not based on the Bible or religion, what is it based on? 
and and for those for those characters for the, your three main characters that, what do you see as the the uh, foundations for their moral compass Jason I, I ja the, the mantra for me for Jason's character was the idea of kind of manifest destiny you know th there's, there's a reason why I had them moving from east to west and this idea of like the foundations of this country the the, the, the modern foundations of this country in terms of you know the, the British influence of like start on one side and just keep moving forward until you you, you reach gold and, and the ocean and and Jason's character is very much capitalist he's moving forward he, he's striving to be the the, the uh, at the top of his game in the business world and everything at the point we meet him in the movie is going just so but his ideology learned from his father as he points out is that that, that sorry is to, to acknowledge your, an apology or to say sorry is a weakness. And that the way the world is established is, is a game of winners and losers. And that, that at the end of the day, if you, you are on an equal footing with everybody else to have the opportunity to win. And if you don't, that's your own fault. And that's his very narrow point of view. Rebecca, on the other hand, represents to me those people who handle life with grace and an and open-heartedness to other people's experience. Um, that it, it may not be a responsibility for you to look back and acknowledge your wrongdoings, but wouldn't it just be a nice human quality to have to be open-hearted enough to acknowledge where your actions may have affected another person's life? And both of those things have definitely uh, religious tones to them if you choose, but they're also just life tones to me. They're, they're the, the way of, you know, ag aggression versus the way of grace, you know. Gordo, on the other hand, is the character that is most in the shadows in the movie. And for me, um, my design of that character is that either at school during the time that he was going through his difficulties or soon after that he went through some kind of, you know, potential religious transformation. That, um, also has its uh, balance of aggression and grace, but more in an Old Testament fashion. And he, you know, we hear a couple of references to it throughout the film. And, um, you know, his, his ideology that, that, you know, he's been through good and bad things, but good things can be turned, bad things can be turned into good things if you put the right faith behind it. He mentions an eye for an eye and, you know, ask it thou shalt receive. But I always had the feeling with Gordo that he is willing to forgive. Uh, and yet, if if the 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 character Simon doesn't meet him in the right place of uh, you know of acknowledge acknowledging contrition, that there'll be something waiting for him, more fire and brimstone than, than anything. And of course, you know, in many ways, the the moral um, landscape and compass of this film is unashamedly simplistic. And and you know, the, I guess in many ways that the genre, of, well, particularly the horror genre, but definitely thriller genres as well. It's funny uh, that there's, a, there's often quite a simplistic moral compass to it. Again, as I say, I don't, I don't presume to say anything um, educational necessarily about bullying because this is definitely a cautionary tale. Um, but I, I think sometimes it's interesting and, you know, people sit down in the cinema, whatever complicated moral... Um, scheme they have in their life often can get reduced and and we we view movies on a scale where we go you did that wrong therefore your punishment should be this you know or you're a good person so you should live and and it's amazing how sometimes uh i think we we showed this movie to a test audience early on and this girl's like you know, I, I wanted to see Jason Bateman's character get, get even worse things happen to him. And we're like, worse things happen to him? We're like, what? And she goes, I thought he should die. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> and that, that, that's more than an eye for an eye, isn't it? Yeah. That's like, yeah. Alice is the latecomer. And, and yeah, we're passing over to Alice. Welcome, Alice. Sorry, we started a little bit early. Thank you for joining us. Uh, yes, uh, you seem to be, uh, your genre from the beginning seems to have film noir aspects. I saw The Square years ago that your brother yeah. directed. And I didn't know if anybody mentioned, I think, something about the uh, Hitchcock references. Yeah. You did? Yeah. How about Polanski? Polanski, yeah. Uh, the yeah. Rosemary's Baby, The Last Shot. Yeah. Well, there's definitely, uh, you know, her in the rocking chair. There's, and, and I also mentioned to you guys, I, I'll challenge you to go back and watch the movie a second time. There's a clue inside the pill cabinet 
which is very Rosemary's Baby. Oh. Um, there's little, there's little kind of moments in there that reference a few filmmakers. Not because I was trying to plagiarise them, but just oh, because just I was tipping my hat That's to them. Um, definitely, uh, definitely The Shining. Definitely Rosemary's Baby. Uh, and 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 there, there's a little kind of gesture towards uh, Michael Haneke too, who's become a really big favourite filmmaker of mine. Um, albeit, you know, a guy who doesn't give any answers in his movies sometimes, um, but. Uh, the, the whole kind of great tapestry of kind of thrillers and noir thrillers and, 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 and many, many uh, Hitchcock movies. Just I just love, you know, when I even hear somebody tell somebody else a Hitchcock story. Just the intrigue that's inherently and built into a story, but yet somehow also is ingrained and, and um, completely tethered necessarily to character. I, I, you know, I always thought there's something worth really striving for and trying not to create gimmicks for movies, but, but more so um, generate great gripping story out of character, you know. And, and uh, so, yeah, I'm glad that, that, that you feel that from those movies. I mean, I'm probably being a little obvious about it anyway, but I appreciate <laughs> no. it. <laughs> thank you. Do you have any other questions since you're late? I want to... I wanna... No? Okay. Hey, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Even can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. It's tight. Don't even try to bite the side of the sky. Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Borg can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.